Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Department of Energy Python Exchange. My name is Cameron Rodell, and I will be your host this evening, afternoon, or morning, right, depending on the time zone that you live in. As you all may know, our goal is to have Python thrive within the National Lab System and its associated research sites. In support of that goal, we are joined here today by our guest panelist, Titus Brown, who is going to share some very, very fantastic thoughts on his experience in developing two scientific Python packages, that's Khmer and Sourmash, which are designed for dealing with really large sequencing uh, biological data sets. But before we get into the agenda and introduce our panelists, I want to remind everyone of a few key points about these exchanges. This call will be recorded, edited, and posted online. As a consequence, please be conscious of the information in the questions that you may ask as to ensure you're not accidentally sharing anything that might be privileged or private. Additionally, as you all know, we are a growing community and we would like to stay in touch with each of you. If you would like to be kept up to date with our monthly exchanges, please sign up for our mailing list, which you can find on the website meetup.doepy.org. For those of you who have never joined us for an exchange, I would like to share uh, with you all that these exchanges are typically broken down into four parts. First, we'll introduce our fantastic lineup of host and guest panelists so that you may all get to know them as well as their respective fields and backgrounds. Second, we'll kick off into our coding activity where we'll ask some very applied questions to our panelists to elicit some practical discussion about best practices in software development and where they fit into the world of academic and scientific research. Third, we'll turn things over to our guest panelists who will share some prepared remarks on how Python is used in his work and how it can fit into the world of our academic researchers. Then to wrap everything up, we will have a full discussion about the points brought up by our guest panelists. For everyone joining us in the audience, this will be your chance to ask questions and engage with our panel. We have a chat box here on the right, as well as a Q&A widget, so feel free to make either use of either of those in order to have your questions heard and be part of our discussion. If you want to see any recordings of our past exchanges or you want to reach out to us with any information that you have, maybe you yourself want to be a guest panelist, you can find all of our information about these exchanges here. Now let's go ahead and dive in to our introduction of our host and guest panelists. For our host panelist lineup, well, First, I'll start by introducing myself a little bit more formally. Hello again, everyone. My name is Cameron Riddell. And while I'm not affiliated with a specific lab, I do have a background in academic research as I studied cognitive sciences in graduate school at UC Davis, where our guest panelist happens to be from. And for today's exchange, I would love to discuss any and all questions related to Python as a whole or specific concepts and uses in Python's vast scientific computing ecosystem relating to tools like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib. Now, moving on to our next host panelist, we are also joined here today by James Powell. And James, I see you're affiliated with NumFocus. What is it that you're here to address for us today, James? What do you, questions do you wanna field from our audience? Hi everybody, my name is James Powell. I serve as the chairman of the NumFocus Board of Directors. If you're interested on how to get more involved in the open source scientific computing community, please let me know. There are events that you can be a part of. There are developer outreach events. There are sprints. There's all sorts of ways for you to contribute to the projects that you use every day. Thank you very much, James. It is a pleasure to have you on as a host panelist. I know you'll help us drive some great discussion around Python. Next up, we are also joined today by Dan Allen. Dan, I see you work at BNL. Dan, what is it that you do and what types of questions would you love to hear from the audience today? Sure, uh, I work in the data science and systems integration program responsible for everything from detector development up to AI and ML. I'm closer to the, the second half of that than the first and happy to answer questions about building informal ground up communities of collaboration across the national labs. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for the role that you play in a lot of this community engagement. 
For those of you who don't know, these Python exchanges could not happen without Dan and the effort that he puts into making sure that all of us host panelists are here and ready. Next up, we're also joined by Tani. Tani, I see that you're at LBNL. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what types of questions you would want to hear from the audience today? Absolutely. Um, so at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, specifically at Advanced Light Source, um, I am a computational research scientist where I work in um, developing data science-based pipelines uh, for operations in general. Um, I would love to uh, receive questions about how we can implement machine learning algorithms and how we can make them more accessible to a larger community. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tani. It is a pleasure to have you as well. I know you'll really help us get through a lot of the kind of machine learning and the talk about crunching large data sets. Now, we are also joined by two extra host panelists before we get into our guest panelists. For our first host panelist, we are also joined here by Padraig Schaefer. Padraig, I know that you're also at BNL along with Dan, but can you tell us a little bit about what you do and the types of questions you would want to hear from the audience today? And Padraig, you might be muted. So double check that. And Patrick, while you sort out the microphone issue over there, we also are joined by one more host panelist. That is someone that you've seen up here with us before, Matthew Feikert. Matthew, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and the types of questions you want to hear from the audience today? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Now, moving on to our guest panelists. We are joined today by Dr. Titus Brown. Dr. Brown, or Titus, is a professor at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And so, Titus, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and the types of questions you would love to hear from the audience today? Hard, hard question to answer. Uh, I think I would start just by saying I've spent 30 years trying to make sense of data research data, and um, I'm, I'm really obsessed by this interplay between uh, um, having some data, needing to build the tools to interrogate the data, then trying to figure out how to communicate the practice of data interrogation using those tools to other people and also teach them how to build their own tools. So um, I'm very involved in open source for that reason, and uh, I also do a lot of training. Um, I've been affiliated with the Carpentries for a long time. And um, I have to say, I, I think, uh, I think mostly I focus on what I would call the bottom 80% of researchers, the people that are just coming into, for example, biology and haven't really had to deal with large amounts of data. And um, I try to I think about how to extend their reach and build capacity at an institutional level for, uh, for biological data analysis. Fantastic. And you said something that actually sparked a, a question that I had. When you're teaching these things, do you find that you're teaching more so the tools or more so the field that you've done your work in? Um, mostly, I, I actually teach, I have taught both. Uh, the field is the, is, is highly, teaching the field is highly motivating for people that have never encountered data science. As mm -hmm. soon as their, their, their toes are wet or maybe their ankles are wet, they suddenly become obsessed with the methods because they realize that, that that's what they really need. But getting over that first hump of like, why do I even need to know this? You have to come from the, here's a problem you probably want to solve or you recognize as a, something someone like you might want to solve. That motivational hump is, is a tough one to, to get people over, but it's the first one and yeah. necessary. I absolutely agree because a lot of time you'll, you'll get stuck in this, how much can I Google just to copy and paste whatever I need and then just try and move on with my life? And you'll never be able to know if the thing that you copied and pasted is actually doing what you expect and you're just kind of pushing that along that you need to keep going back and relying on other people having done the code work for you. So I'm very pleased to have you join us. Thank you so much, Titus. 
And I want to share that you all, everyone in our audience, can become a host panelist as well. All you need to do is reach out to us or reach out to us to recommend one of your friends or colleagues. And our email, of course, is doepy at dutc.io. Now, let's move into our coding activity. For the Python Exchange, we always have a coding activity, and these are designed to be a lot of fun and spark some great discussion. Today's activity is called Worse Than Nothing, and so let's dive in and see what we have in store. The game Worse Than Nothing? Well, is something really better than nothing? Let's find out. Our panelists will be presented with things that we usually tell scientists, researchers, or even developers to do all the time, as though they are universally good ideas. Our job will be to identify circumstances or situations where doing these things could be worse than doing nothing at all. We will be scoring our panelists based on their discussion for specificness and bonus points for relatable anecdotes and experiences working with scientific researchers. And don't worry, we're not actually grading you. I'm not writing anything down. But I think if you have any personal or relatable anecdotes, please do share. All right, in round one. This round is titled, Comments in Your Code. When is it the case that a scientist adding comments to their code could be worse than adding no comments at all? And I'll go ahead and I'll open this up to any of our panelists, hosts or guest panelists. Um, sure, so I think uh, some few things that come to mind, of course, um, would be um, the, how clear, for example, the code will be. I mean, it, obviously, like every comment is appreciated. Um, seeing a lot of comments uh, being populated with new code, it's amazing and it's always a good thing to have. Uh, but it also comes down to uh, what's the context of these comments? Do they really uh, reflect, for example, um, what is going on within the lines of code? Are they easy to read? Uh, something that do come to mind, and this happened a very, very long time ago when I was still, um, I think, in a school back in the day. Um, and the choice of language when there is a diverse community uh, committing or, um, in this case, developing a piece of code, if we all speak, for example, different languages and come from many different countries, uh, probably deciding on a common language among these uh, collaborations is, is uh, of course, a very important piece uh, and something that will come very uh, natural as well. But sometimes uh, these things could happen. Um, I have not seen something like that in a very long time, but that was the first thing that actually um, came to mind when I saw this comment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that for the most part, I think uh, they are very relevant and they are mostly positive. Uh, but I will also say the context uh, of the comments and how um, they can, in this case, guide somebody through the lines are probably the key thing of like how valuable they really are. Yeah, and I, I totally agree, you know, having some type of organization around how you comment, because if I see a pull request with somebody else's comments, I'm really gonna think, is it valuable to actually have these comments in it, in, in the code or not? And so I would love to hear from any other of our panelists who might have some thoughts on when adding comments might do more harm than benefit. What if the comments were right when they were first written, but then the code changed and now the comments are no longer reflective of what's actually there? I think that would spell for a small disaster, but Titus, it seems like you might have uh, some oh, thoughts here. James, James got my first one. Uh, the number of people who change or slash or quote fix the code and then don't change the comments to match, including myself, right? It, it's a it is is high. Um, I'll say uh, th this is going to be slightly controversial, but I actually tell my students not to bother with comments until they have tests because mm. um, tests are more important than comments. Executing the code is more important than describing what the code might one day have done in the past. <laughs> um, I love that. And, and I'll add, I'll add one more, which is sometimes comments are entirely obvious. Set X to five, X equals five. Yeah. Like that, that just takes up space on the screen that could be used for spacing. Um, but my favorite, and, and this is, this comes from a, a pretty traumatic incident when I was an undergrad actually, is the overly honest comments. Um, 
uh, I was working one of my first big scientific computing projects. I was working on on something where a grad student had been sort of flailing to to get the code to work, and the comments were the comment was something like the last three corrections didn't do the trick. Here's an, let's try another one. And and so that's the kind of comment that that chills your blood, like yeah. okay. You, Overly honest, I'm glad you told me. Now I'm worrying about the whole software, not just <laughs> this line. Yeah, if comments can spell disaster for the rest of the script, I think it would be those words right there. Absolutely. Any other thoughts from our panel before we move on to round two? I think this has been a good discussion about comments and code. Can you hear me now? Yes, Patrick, welcome. All right. <laughs> um, I suppose another thing is if it gets in the right, it gets in the way of writing better code. It can be tempting to try to explain a very complex section of code rather than make that section simpler. Absolutely, right? Because you can kind of get stuck in a specific way of thinking because you're letting the comments kind of guide your thoughts there. And you might be not thinking about how you could refactor it to something that describes itself. We're here for the I like the phrase. Yeah. I, I like the phrase, every comment is an apology. <laughs> I've never heard that, Dan, but I absolutely love that. And Dan, I see we have in the chat uh, from Phil, rich variable name, variable or function names are the comments that we can have in our code. Now, of course, I think there's a limit. If I see a function that's like 60 characters, right, just in its name with probably like 10 underscores, I think you've written more of a sentence than a function name, but I do believe that, you know, having descriptive variable names, things not like X, I, M, J, K, like the whole individual alphabet, uh, it kind of hurts when I see variable names be used like that. I'm okay with it in for loops, you know, for I in range, that's fine. But it's as soon as you get, for you know, nested for loops for I, for J, for K, you're thinking, wait a minute, what's going on? There's got to be a better way of doing this. All right, I think that takes us to a great spot for the end of round one. Let's move on to round two. Slightly related to comments, but documentation. When is it the case that a scientist writing documentation for their code could be worse than writing no documentation at all? Does it give anybody pause that we spend so much effort writing documentation, but nobody ever reads it? Or is that just how it works? Dance, I'm, please not, note, I'm not nobody that chimed cynical in to say it. they read documentation. I, I'm not that cynical about it. I think one, one way, one strategy for writing documentation is when somebody emails you a question about how something works, you write the documentation, you publish the documentation in a hurry, and then you send them a link to the documentation, not necessarily mentioning that the documentation was created for that question. And it will reinforce the sense that they could go and check the documentation. Or uh, at the very least, you won't have to type the same answer. Hi. Uh, sorry, Tani, did you want to go? Oh, yeah, no, I had a very small comment. Um, I was just going to say that um... Um, I think it also comes with like how intuitive as well it is. For example, if I'm adopting either like a package or if it's a, a graphical user interface, if I have to constantly see the docs because I cannot move forward from step A from to step B, then I think there is some refactoring as well that probably my code is needing at the moment. Um, I mean, of course, I think that documentation is extremely important. It gets us started. It gives us an idea of what the code can do. We can find examples on where to start. But when we have to constantly refer to it and we cannot, for example, find things or it's not uh, documented in a way of, uh, OK, I, I'm, this is the first time that I'm looking at the code. What do I do? Where do I start? If it doesn't uh, guide me through it and instead I just get more confused, then I think it's not really valuable for a user. Thanks yeah. for that. And I know a lot of projects are shifting more towards um, like a gallery style or example style documentation. See this end to end example and you can copy and paste what you need or make what you need. And it's usually heavily commented examples so you can make sense of it even if it's your first time using the library. Um, but there definitely, I think, I think there can also be too much documentation. But before we go down that route, uh, Titus, did you have something to say to that earlier point? Yeah, uh, well, let me let me start by saying um, I, I think everybody sort of circled exactly the answer 
that I would have to your question, which is, you know, um, when the documentation doesn't serve the needs of any particular user and or isn't discoverable, then you've spent all that time writing your documentation and it's detracted from things you could could have spent your time, your other time doing. And I'll show you some of the documentation stuff that I've been putting into to my project, uh, my projects in a little bit. But I would say these days I'm actually writing documentation for AI to read. Right. Mm. I figure in bioinformatics, everybody's using chat GPT to write their code or whatever the other with a copilot to write their code. Yeah. So my job isn't to write documentation for users anymore. It's to write a set of examples that AI can can easily can, can grab and then and then regurgitate in a context specific way to the users. And I, I don't know how that's going to work out, but that's that 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 that's where I'm heading these days. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a very a very good pursuit. Um, we're not joined by Tom Caswell today, but he's the lead developer on Matplotlib, and I have a few other friends on that core development team. And one thing that they are constantly complaining about is when people ask ChatGPT for Matplotlib help. It uses usually the outdated PyPlots uh, global stateful API instead of the object-oriented API. And they're trying very hard to make sure all of their new documentation is pushing you know, the object-oriented methods. But you have people going to chat GPT and it's just giving them very old, outdated code snippets because it's been pulling data from Stack Overflow. And as we all know, Matplotlib has been around for, I think, about two decades at this point. And so there's a lot of old examples on there that's they weren't bad practice at the time they were written, but by now they have become outdated. So I think it's very important that we are targeting these things that are, are essentially crawling the internet and scraping all the examples they can in order to form our coherent language models because they are being used very widely. Any other thoughts on when is writing documentation worse than writing no documentation? All right, then that takes us to the end of round two. Let's move on to round three, testing. When is it the case that writing tests for your code could be worse than having written no tests at all? And this up to the floor. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I think that it can be difficult to, uh, I've experienced this, it can be difficult to figure out the right level of testing and you can make your tests overly specific, that they're just basically locking your code into some meaningless <laughs> hard-coded format rather than providing much value. Yeah, you kind of, if you're developing a function that you're working on at the same time you're writing the test, then you're just thinking usually about that one instantaneous problem that you have, and you want that function to solve that problem, so you throw in your test, and you think, as soon as I finish this one specific problem and my test passes, I think the function will work. And a lot of times you haven't captured a lot of the edge cases for that. Or do I have this variable in my module? Is that what I'm really <laughs> going to be testing for? Yeah. Yep, exactly. Does anybody else enjoy it when you get a new piece of software and you run all the tests and half the tests succeed and half the tests fail and you can't tell, is it my fault that I break something or is this just broken and you waste a couple of days of your time and you go to the person and say, oh, that test never succeeded, just ignore it. Or when you're on, uh, if you're on GitHub and you see the list of pull requests and you're like, oh, the tests have been failing for like five months now, does nobody care? <laughs> Yeah, but Titus, I, were you about to say something? I, I just, I, you know, I love James' point. Like the the tests that never worked in the first place, and you're like, there's so many problems with this. Like you wrote the test and it doesn't work. It still doesn't work. Nobody seems to care. Nobody's running the tests regularly. What what's going on with this project? It's like a bad project smell. Um, one of the reasons I love something, you know, continuous integration is at least somebody somewhere can run your tests and have them pass, right? I should Absolutely. also be clear, I am criticizing only myself for things that I myself have definitely done in projects that I've worked on. Any other thoughts on testing? All right, if there are no other thoughts on testing, this was our final round. So 
why don't we go ahead and shift gears? And I'm going to turn the reins over to Titus, who has prepared some remarks to share with us on how Python is being used in his work and how he uses it to influence those around him. Titus. So mostly what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some, something that I guess I'll call my, I don't know if it's a labor of love or an obsession or, or what, but it's a, it's, a, it's a command line tool in Python library that, that lets you look at um, sequencing data on large scales. And I'll give you some of the background and so on. I'm going to just go to my notes uh, in a second. Um, so, um, but first, before I, I do that, I'm, I'm going to try and monitor the chat. So please go ahead and uh, let's see, you can probably see that. Let me move that off to a different screen. I'll try and monitor the chat. And I know there's like a 20 second lag. So please just go ahead and type questions into the chat and I will answer them as I can, because I suspect the lag on the questions is not 20, 20 seconds. All right. So, um, so at a high level, uh, Saramash does basically one thing and one thing only. It, given two sets of um, DNA or RNA words, it, it tells you how much overlap there is between, between these two sets. And so um, I have a little, uh, speaking of documentation, I have a little notebook, uh, an introduction to KMERS for genome comparison and analysis. This is a Jupyter notebook, um, which I ran here to make sure that it actually works. And the, and the idea behind Sour Mesh is, is really pretty trivial. Um, we define two measures, Jacquard similarity and Jacquard containment. Um, and these are just, the Jacquard similarity is uh, inter intersection of the two sets divided by the union of this, the size of the union of the two sets. And the Jacquard containment is, um, is, is not symmetric. It's uh, the Jacquard containment of, uh, let's see, B in a is the intersection between B and A over the size of, of A. And so if you, you, there's some simple examples of stuff, you, you basically say, well, the Jacquard similarity between anything in itself is, is one, the um, Jacquard containment of something in itself is one, the similarity between two things that share, so here B and A share ATGG, and they do not share AACC or CACA is, is one third because it's one shared over three total. And, and so you can do all the, and you know, the, the Jacquard similarity between things that share nothing, A and C here is zero. So Jacquard similarity is a distance measure. Jacquard containment is not, I believe, because it's not symmetric. And, and so you can do things like graph, you know, do the Venn diagram thing and graph, graph the words. And I should just say, um, uh, you know, here we're using DNA words that are very short. Typically, typically you use DNA words that are sort of 20 to 30 to 50 basis long. So you get sort of very high levels of um, specificity to the content of whatever documents you're looking at. So uh, an analogy that I use frequently is suppose you have two, two books and you want to know how similar the contents of the books are. You decompose them into words and then you ask questions about the Jacquard similarity um, between the books and, and so on and so forth. So fundamentally, all that um, Saramash does is calculate this overlap between two sets uh, for um, uh, lossy compressed compressed sets. So um, to show you some some specific code, and I'm not going to walk through the Python code at any particular high level of detail. But basically, you take a sequence, you take a word size, you walk over the entire sequence, you extract every word. This now includes overlaps. You build a list and you return those. You can turn this into a generator function if you want, and all that other stuff. So if you build KMERS, if you run this build KMERS function on a, a short sentence of DNA. Um, with the K of 21, you get all overlapping 21 base pair windows, and you can see how you know it shifts to the right. So this is this starts here, this starts here, this starts here, and so on and so forth. And so now you can use this to compare two sequences. So suppose you have two sequences with two difference with only two base pair differences in there, two base differences. This in here, uh, the the A and a T, and the A and a G, and otherwise they're the same. There's a camera size of 10. You build the KMERS for that, and you look at the Jacquard similarity, you'll see that um, Jacquard similarity is actually quite low. It's about 0 0.9, 0 0.09. And that's because most of the 10 base windows in this sequence overlap one of the differences. So the 10 mer, I think that's about 10, that's here is different from the 10 mer that is here. So KMERS are, are they diverge very rapidly as um, two DNA sequences diverge. The, 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 the KMERS become different very quickly, and the Jacquard similarity is very sensitive to these differences. But now, when we, when we work with data sets, we tend to work with much larger data sets than this. We tend to work with microbial genomes that can be three to five million 
uh, bases of DNA. And so um, here I have I have a, a code that reads in one of these files, and I don't you can see it's a four it's a five hundred thousand base five hundred thousand letter file. You can read these k-mers in. You can um, get your card similarity between two very different genomes and two somewhat similar genomes, and you can sort of see that you know, Jacquard containment and so on works, and you can get plot Venn diagrams of them. So, okay, so this is all the background for what Saramesh does. We want to do these kinds of comparisons very fast and very quickly um, uh, and, and in low memory. And the challenge really is that um, the numbers are quite large. So these are for pretty typical bacterial genomes. Uh, you would have about 5 million in each of these sets. And 5 million of anything is is, is reasonably slow. So what we do with Saramash, and, and this, there's a whole um, group of sketching algorithms in, in biology that do similar things, is we, we throw away a bunch of the data while retaining the ability to do things like calculate Jacquard overlap and Jacquard um, similarity and Jacquard containment. So what we do, and I'm happy to answer questions about this um, in sort of arbitrary detail, but basically we, we pick a hash function that takes DNA k-mers, converts them into numbers, and then we... we um, discard all numbers over a certain uh, uh, over a certain threshold. So literally the hash function that is under that underlies everything we do in KHMER is, is this. We we load in uh, we load in the DNA we, we load in the KMER, we calculate its reverse complement because DNA is double stranded. So um, a, uh, A's convert to T's and C's convert to G's and vice versa. And and in in double stranded DNA those are um, sort of A G DC is equivalent to GGE, and so you have to collapse those properly and determine the canonical KMER. This is sort of biology specific stuff. The key point is we take this canonical KMER, we hash it into a 64 bit number, and then we, um, we, we return that hash and we, we make sure the hash value is always positive. So now we can turn any DNA word into a number. And um, this doesn't actually change the Jacquard calculations because if you calculate on the KMERS or on the hashes of the KMERS, it's more or less a one-to-one -one mapping of hashes to KMERS with murmur hash. And so, so all the numbers stay more or less the same. Then the next thing we do after hashing is we throw away a bunch of the numbers. And we do that in this case. The, the, the theory behind this is, is fairly well explained in one of our papers. Um, it's essentially a modulo hash. We basically say we want to throw out 999 out of every 1,000 k-mers. So to do that, we pick this number scaled, which is sort of the compression ratio, and we divide the maximum range of the hash space by the size of that, uh, by that scaled value. Say we want to keep one out of 1,000 k-mers from the hash space. And then basically we walk through all the k-mers, hash them, and we say, if it's below that threshold, keep it, otherwise discard. And this has the effect of um, uh, pseudo randomly discarding 999 out of a, every 1,000 hashes of KMERS. And when you apply that to big, big sets, you go from big sets of KMERS, you go from um, about 500,000 KMERS down to about 500 KMERS, about one in a thousand. And the cool thing is, you can show mathematically and also practically the Jacquard calculations don't change very much, and you can place bounds on how much they change and so on and so forth. You can sort of see you go from hundreds of thousands of KMERS or hashes down to many fewer, but the intersection, the overlap sizes don't don't really change. So that's that took longer than I expected it to take, sorry, but that's sort of the fundamental thing that goes behind, um, under all of the uh, um, things that Saramash does, is we take very large collections of DNA words and we throw away, you know, a tunable amount of them while retaining the ability to do certain specific kinds of calculations. Okay, so, um, I'm going to keep on going, but please ask questions. Uh, I will send this, I'll put this in the chat as well. This is on our documentation, this is on our documentation site, um, and it's a Jupyter notebook. So what we do with Saramash is we, um, we, we, we let you do things like take large files and sketch them into these, uh, these hashed collections that we call then um, signature files, .sig files. And they tend to be much, much, much smaller. They tend to be about a thousand fold smaller than the original data sets. And so we're basically decreasing the file size and the, the memory size requirements for what we do by a factor of about a thousand. And this turns out to, to basically let us scale um, to current data set sizes. We can scale from petabytes down to terabytes, which means we can work within petabytes of sequencing data down to terabytes of sequencing data. 
So that gives us sort of a lot of leverage. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one philosophy that I've learned through the years is you can't, speed's not enough. You can't just optimize your code and win because at least in sequencing world, in a sequencing land, um, more data is always being generated. And, and for the last 20 years, uh, sequencing has improved faster than Moore's law, which means that, that if you don't develop new algorithms and you just speed up code, like you're still going to kind of lose out. Um, the other thing is compression is not really enough. Even lossy compression isn't enough um, because the data set sizes keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so we've also focused on things like streaming and flexibility of analysis. So how much can we subsample the data set in a way that is biologically relevant? These are all things that physicists are are very well aware of from the, the, the collider world. You know, you collect all the data and then you run it through multiple filters that that know something about the, the science that's going on. and um, uh, I've been trying to do the same thing here. Uh, I, just to note, I was, I was sort of trained early on in my career by physicists, so um, I, I definitely have tried to steal many of their good ideas uh, for this. Okay, so let me just go check to see if there are any questions. Um, cool. I don't have any questions, which means you either all tuned out or everything I've said is comprehensible or you're struggling to formulate one. I don't know. I don't know in which one. Um, so please do feel free to ask questions or you can wait and, and ask me in about 10 minutes. Um, I'll just say we, we do things like um, make it very easy for biologists to take a bunch of genomes and compare them and build a, 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 um, and build a clustered comparison matrix. This is the main reason we get cited, or this is the, the main original source of citations is people generate 500 genomes or 1,000 genomes and want to compare them all. And you can do that in sort of 10 minutes after installing Sour Mash, and people really like that. Um, but we, we can do a lot more. Uh, we do a lot more with Sour Mash. So um, uh, that's a lot of what we've been doing is sort of trying to figure out what else we can do with this. I will say on the Python side of things, um, the foundation on which all of this rests uh, all of our expansion and all of our uses rest are tests, documentation, and PRs. Uh, um, so every change that we um, we put in uh, goes through, you know, continuous integration and automated tests. We have I don't know, somewhere like 2,000 tests. Uh, they run on multiple versions of Python on multiple machines. So here we have tests running on Mac OS. We have tests running on um, Ubuntu. Uh, we don't have tests running on Windows, although it does work on Windows mostly. Um, and then we have, you know, the documentation gets built. We have code coverage analysis, so at least our code coverage doesn't go down. We build wheels on a regular basis, so you can install them automatically from Python. Uh, and then we actually have something that I'll talk about in a little set in a little bit, which is sort of Rust up here somewhere. Uh, it should be up here somewhere. Somewhere in here, there are Rust tests, <laughs> which I'll talk about. I don't know where they went. Okay, there should be Rust tests. Okay, well, that, that's embarrassing. There are lots of Rust tests. Um, we also have, uh, um, I wouldn't say amazing documentation, but we have pretty good documentation. Um, and I've been told by people it's good. And a large part of that is because we, uh, we do what was suggested during the panel discussion, which is when someone asks a question, we answer the question, and then we, um, by writing it into our documentation. We actually do something slightly different which is we uh, we open an issue um, based on Slack comments or email content comments or other issues, and then we answer it in the issues. We slap it with a doc label, and then periodically we go through and put all of the things that ended up on our issue tracker as documentation updates into our documentation. I'm actually currently going through that right now. We're going to be expanding our documentation with an FAQ and with a new front page based on this diataxis.fr. Uh, um, documentation structure, which I really like, uh, which talks about how to how to organize your documentation. But so all of our expansion rests on, you know, we have tests, we have documentation, we have pull requests. Every time we add a new feature, part of the code review is did you did you add this into the documentation? Did you add tests for it? Has code coverage gone uh, at least not gone down? And and what this lets us do is innovate pretty wildly because. We can actually be pretty sure at this point when we add a new feature that we're not breaking core aspects of the old data, the old uh, the old software functionality. And um, I don't, you know, I think that's all entirely obvious probably to many of the people attending, but it's still very new to new programmers, including new computer scientists or computer scientists, science grads, uh, undergrads, and grad students. 
Um, something that we do that I think is pretty non-standard is we do use the issue tracker in a very um, broad way. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. So um, I, I do this a lot. I'm, I'm the main guilty person uh, doing this. Um, we, uh, when broad questions like this come up, I tend to go through the issue tracker and link between the various um, issues that, that discuss this. And uh, of course, pull requests linked to these issues and so on. So um, there's a sort of meme in our lab where when a new person asks like, uh, have you thought about doing this? Or what if we did this? Or, or, or why don't we do this? Um, there's almost always an issue discussing exactly why we don't do this. And if there isn't, there will be soon because that's usually how I answer people's questions. Um, I will say that, that uh, let me go through, let me find a, a, the issue I wanted to cover here. Um, I will say that when we started with this, uh, I did not have a clear set of use cases for SourMesh. Um, and uh, over the years, um, I just sort of had the sense that this kind of thing would be useful. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time exploring possible use cases. And a, a really big value of Python for us in this case was it was slow, but it let us iterate on the code and the functionality really quickly and easily. And only after we sort of had a good set of basic use cases did we start to harden the code into either C++ or now Rust for the purpose of making it much faster. The value of Python was both the ability of for experts, but also uh, there were a lot of people in the lab who weren't necessarily software engineers or programmers, um, but could pick up Python quickly enough to write their own scripts and do sort of off-label uses of our internal data structures. There was a lot of early stage issues like, could we use it for this? And yeah, here's a code snippet, and then somebody would develop that into a script, and then we'd, we'd pull it into Sour Mash and make it a command line um, option. So that's been, that's been fantastic. Uh, our use cases, they keep on coming up. I record them here as different people um, make comments. You can see a lot of them came around in 2017, but then they keep on you know, adding, uh, adding more and more over the years. Um, and uh, people keep on asking us more questions, coming up with better use cases. Um, and our, our most recent expansion has actually been um, this paper, which is, it turns out that uh, there's reasons why you want to search all of the available data. So literally petabyte scale sequence search. And um, our underpinnings are now reliable enough and fast enough that we can um, now scale to terabytes of compressed data, which represent petabytes of uncompressed data. And um, we actually have a very cool, probably should have put this in the, uh, let's see, we now have a very cool thing that lets you search uh, approximately 700,000 data sets um, uh, in the space of about five seconds. My favorite one to show is, uh, Prochlorococcus, which is a, a widespread and abundant marine cyanobacter. Oops, I didn't want to click on that. I wanted to click on the exam. Wait, how do we, oh, sorry. I click it here and then I say submit. And what's going on behind the scenes is that the Joint Genome Institute hosts a server that has indexed uh, um, 700,000 data sets and we can plot where this particular genome matches in DNA sequence taken from the environment. And so since this is a marine, a very common marine organism, basically all of the green dots here represent different environmental sequencing data sets taken from the ocean. And basically every ocean sample and most water samples or many, most saltwater samples have this organism in there. So it's sort of a map of what data sets have been collected. Uh, you can also do this for, for custom, custom genomes. So we're working on how to scale what we do to all available public data. Um, we're kind of obsessive about this uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, but um, you know, people, people find it interesting even if we don't have strong use cases for it. So I feel like I spend a lot of time exploring the space of use cases and trying to identify what it is people actually want to do before they know they can do it. Just a, always a, I, I enjoy it, but it's, it's hard to explain to other biologists why I do what I do. Like I do, I try and enable the things that you don't know you want to do yet is, is, is a little bit of a hard pitch. Um, the last two things I wanted to just briefly talk about before I take questions. Oh, I see. Um, I will talk about Rust, yes. Uh, and um, last two things I want to talk about, one is Rust and one is plugins. So um, if you go scratch the surface of Mesh, what you'll find is a couple of years ago, uh, then graduate student, then postdoc, and now um, independent contributor 
um, re uh, took our C++ layer and re-implemented it in Rust. Um, and at first, there wasn't really a strong, like, the shift to Rust wasn't, um, I was like, okay, it's, it's, it's enough that you like it a lot. And I don't like C++ that much, so let's give it a try. And it worked out well. Um, and then he would he he uh, Luis uh, started um, taking advantage of the fact that Rust has really effective multi-threading. And so what enabled this paper uh, this paper was literally the same underlying Rust extension code, but with a Rust front end that let us use the multi-threading capabilities to their fullest. Thermash itself itself the Python stuff is still actually single threaded because we, ha we haven't raised the sort of level of the data structures we use to take advantage of, of threading yet. The interface is still a little too granular. So we're still doing a lot of the sort of um, management work in Python, but a lot of the underlying stuff is in Rust, loading the data and, and doing the calculations, which means you can write a very short uh, function that loads stuff in using the same underlying Rust code, but then uses Rust multi-threading to do very fast, um, large scale searches. So um, the specific, the other thing that that's related to that uh, is we have now, um, well, so we have what's called a, we have a plugin interface in Sour Mesh. Uh, let me see if I can find the developer information, and it should be should be a plugin, Sour Mesh plugins. We have a a, a plugin, um, a Python plugin um, architecture that lets us. Uh, read, read and save in new formats and also gives us a command line interface, uh, a way to add things to the command line interface. And we've, um, implemented, sorry, I'm losing track of my tabs here. We have implemented this thing called Pio3 branch water. Uh, and I'm going to show you the single thing that's kind of impressive. It's, it's actually about this simple in practice. Um, which is uh, we have a bunch of Rust code here that is directly exposed via the Pi function macro in the Pi03 um, Rust uh, library. Uh, this Pi function exposes this Rust function do many search, which takes in string, float, unsigned integer, and so on and so forth, and turns it into a function that's directly callable from Python with no extra to work. So we've started, we, we took the plugin interface, built a whole other layer on top of our Rust library, that sort of is at a high conceptual level and lets us do multi-threading and then expose that to Python and build a plugin interface around that. I um, know that sounds very complicated, but it's, um, it's actually pretty simple in practice. It's surprisingly simple in practice. If you look at this do many search function and you go look at the Python code, um, there is a function in search. The many search code has the plugin and then literally this is the, the line of code that calls the Rust function to do very fast multi-threaded stuff. And so this has this is something we've been working on only in the last couple of um, months. Uh, and it's let us speed up Sour Mash, specific functions in Sour Mash by factors of um, uh, 100 to 1,000 fold, partly because Rust is faster and better at optimizing um, its compiled. Uh, and also because of the multi-threading. So we can now take really efficient advantage of multiple cores, which of course most, most processors have nowadays. Um, and so this has made it all of a sudden escalated our software to the point where things that used to take hours to days on a, uh, you know, 256 gigabyte of RAM chassis now can be done on my laptop in, in half an hour. Um, so, yeah, so I have lots of things to say. I'll just say Rust is truly lovely. I've, I've just in the last couple of months, I got to the point where I'm, I'm effective, if dangerous with it. Luis is, of course, very good at it. Um, and then Tessa Pierce Ward, who is a postdoc, or a, sorry, an assistant researcher in my group, is also contributing here. So we are a big fan of both plugins, which let us introduce novelty into Sour Mash without like breaking other old stuff that should stay working, and lets us explore new things, and then also expose it to users in a way that is sort of somewhat separate from the uh, core Sour Mash functionality, so it can be installed and rely on on different um, uh, packages and so on. So I'm, I, I know that wasn't particularly coherent. I ran through a bunch of stuff. I'm happy to take questions on anything I said. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's, I think I should probably probably stop sharing and come back to, uh, to, to the video and see what people have to say.
bit of whirlwind tour. <laughs> Sorry, Cameron. yeah, that was, it was a little <laughs> bit of everything, and I absolutely loved it. Sorry, it seems like a, a very neat tool, especially for your field. Um, I would like to open it up for any questions. So if you're in the audience, enter your questions either in the chat or the Q&A widget. And to our panelists, if you have any questions to ask Titus, either about uh, SireMash specifically or what it's like to maintain uh, software while also being a researcher. I know I have a few questions about that, but I'll open the floor to our panelists and to our audience first. I'll, I'll put one out there. You mentioned uh, earlier on when you um, when you get people over that hump and then they really love the method, they get really excited about the methods. Do they fall so far into the methods that they become data scientists or is there like a natural stopping point where this enables them to do their original work in, in a fuller way? So, fantastic question. Um, you know, it depends on where they are in their career. Stage, right. If I'm dealing with graduate students, um, the overriding concern of most graduate students is to get their PhD, which is as it should be, to make progress on their analysis. So um, often they will they will stop or be forcefully pulled out of the rabbit hole of coding to make progress on their PhD if they're in a fairly traditional biology lab. And I would say, you know, I would I would guess that maybe 80 percent of biologists need to have some data science skills at this point, given the amount of data that's flooding, flooding the field. Um, so, you know, it can be as simple as I generated some data or somebody else in my lab generated some data and God help us, we need to, we need to know what the data means. Uh, or it can be, um, or they can slowly realize the horror of having too much data and start to realize that they should, and, and, and depending on the project, that they need to interact with larger data sets than anybody in the lab previously understood. And then they have to become expert at workflow systems and, you know, niche kinds of analyses and so on and so forth. So that's during graduate school. Um, I would say then that um, after that, there seems to be, and I'm making up these numbers, I would guess that there's sort of an even split. Some people are like, oh my God, this is way better than doing experiments. And they go off and they become, you know, biological data scientists, bioinformaticians, whatever. Some people are like, you know, I love biology. Um, I want to be, I want to continue in academia. I want to answer biological questions, but I want to work at a, this is I, higher always implies a moral judgment. I would just say um, I want to work with other people's data, public data. And that's what I think a lot of biotech companies need now, right? There's they're generating so much data that it might as well be somebody else's data. And they need people that can that aren't just data that aren't just data scientists, but they combine that deep biology domain with the ability to to handle many data sets. And, and a lot of graduates of my lab go on in that area. And then there's the people that are like, you know what? I actually don't like sitting in front of a computer all day long, but I do need to analyze my own data. And now I know how to do that. And I'm going to go on and do the next set of experiments with the confidence that I have some idea of how to analyze it next. I don't, you know, it's such a personal journey that um, it's just what people like. <laughs> but I try to enable all three. I've had, I had one postdoc that I worked with who went on to become, um, who had never programmed before working with me. Um, picked up some Kamer stuff, and then seven years, eight years later is now leading a software development team writing Rust code. I was like, how did that happen? She's like, look, it's not any more complicated than lab work. It's just a different set of details. And I was like, yeah. wow, okay, I didn't expect that to happen, but that's wonderful. Cool. That's very good. Thank, thank you for sharing, Titus. Um, Dan, did you have a follow-up? Nope, that was it. Thanks, Titus. I have a question. Yes, Patrick. Um, so, as the the community has grown, both of the contributors and the users of Sour Mash, I'm wondering what you've seen in the evolution of the way that you maintain and present the project. You know, whether that's the sophistication or style of the documentation, or the emphasis on testing, or the way you're responding to issues. Can Can you comment on that? Yeah. So I've thought about this a lot, and I don't know that I have a good. I, I don't know that I have a good handle on it. I will say that. I feel like there's multiple shells. There's the people that sort of swing on by, pick up Saramash to build their one figure and never seem to talk to us again. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, and I don't know how many people there, I, that's mostly evidenced by citations. Like, oh, cool, this paper used Saramash. I never, I don't know, I, I see what they did and they didn't apparently need more, so that's great. Then there are people that desperately wanna do something. Um, they've heard that Saramash can do it. 
and it's not really in the documentation, it's sort of a slightly off-label use. And they will sometimes pop up in issues or email or Slack and be like, okay, how do I do this? And usually what I try and do is write up a couple tips and tricks for them. Uh, and I stick it in an issue so I can find it later. These days I'm getting closer to just writing a plugin to do the darn thing for them. Um, and, uh, you know, they often, hopefully they go away happy. Sometimes I never hear from them again. I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what happens. Um, and that's all fine. Um, the people that I, that I really cherish are the ones that interact repeatedly and say, okay, I want to do this. Your documentation's unclear. I do this, I get weird results. What's going on? And then that's usually either a bug or it's an off-label use that's a new use case where I need, we need to adjust Sour Mash. And that's, those are fantastic. And then the one more shell that's sort of usually one step removed from my lab are the people that, that really want to take full advantage from my perspective of what Sour Mash can do. And they get into, they start to need to get into the theory to some extent, like, why does this work? Can this work? How do I do that? And they're the ones that really inform our, um, our, our deeper dive documentation. They're the ones asking, I got this weird result. Is this biology or is this related to the underlying theory of what you're doing? And then I have to like sometimes go, I don't know. I had a long conversation with somebody just yesterday who's using FireMesh to do things that are at least two orders of magnitude more complicated than anything else we've ever done. And he was trying to figure out how to summarize his data. And I was like, I, you're asking great questions. I'm happy to work with you on finding the answers. When you find the answers, we will write them into our documentation because we need to know how to do this too. So I think that that's the, that then informs sort of what I would call the final tier, um, which is the people in my lab. Um, and many people in my lab come from a biology background, some from computer science, some from physics, some from, from other places. And I have, I'm trying out this idea where I'm the person, I'm one of the main maintainers of Sour Mesh, and my job is to let the biologists who come into my lab who want to use it for something, figure out what they need to do, and then adjust Sour Mesh so it does exactly what they need to do. It puts me in a weird situation since I'm sort of the service partner for my graduate students, but it, it fills this really nice function of driving Sour Mesh development in a way that's very use case driven even if we can't explain what those use cases are for several years until the graduate student has gotten good results. So those are all the shells that I sort of see. We, we don't have a lot of contributors from outside the lab. Um, and I think, I think there's probably several reasons. One is just that there's not a lot of, on the scale of things, biology is nine, I, I don't mean this in a bad way. Biology is like 99% users and 1% programmers. And that's just because of the way the field has evolved. We don't teach numerical methods to biologists, to biology graduate students, uh, undergraduates. We don't, you know, we don't teach teach people the skill set they need in order to contribute to and use open source fully. Something very weird going on with blue jeans on my screen. I don't know if you guys are seeing that, but we can still hear you fine, and everything looks okay on my okay, end. Okay, great. Okay, just a weird resizing bug. Yeah, so. So yeah, so that was probably too complete an answer, but that's what I see. Fantastic. Now we do have some questions in the Q&A from Matt. Oh. So Matt, if you want to provide any clarification, please feel free to hop on audio. Oh, I just saw the q and I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't even so know I'll that read was there. Out for our yeah, you're fine. Yeah, oh. thank you very much, Titus, for the, the great talk. Uh, and as a particle physicist, I'm happy to hear that uh, you've had positive interactions with our field in the past. Uh, I think actually in the last like two sentences, you kind of addressed some of two of my questions. So I can maybe kind of skip those because you talked about uh, that the contributor community is mostly um, just your lab uh, at the moment for the like the core contributor community. And then you also, uh, well, I'll, I'll still ask this. Um, so in the particle physics community, we're trying to focus on building an ecosystem of interoperable Pythonic tools uh, for data analysis, which we call scikit-hep. Uh, so does Sour Mesh exist in a broader biometric ecosystem, or is the ecosystem more like the Brown Lab tooling ecosystem? Yeah, so really excellent questions. Um, and I should say, I've actually published biology papers with a well-known particle high-energy physicist. Uh, in the past, my father was a physicist too, so I, I cheated in all the possible ways of interacting with with with, with physicists. Um, so, um, so to answer your question, so um, I have to a large extent 
this is going to sound really fatalistic, but it's a, it's a useful perspective. Well, all of the surprises I get from having this perspective are happy ones. I've more or less given up on convincing bioinformaticians or biologists to use SourMesh. What I want to do is demonstrate the value of the perspectives and kinds of data analysis. And if someone wants to re-implement them in their own tool, I'm a thousand percent okay with that. Every algorithm that we have in SourMesh, I think we have maybe three or four um, interesting algorithms. And by interesting, I mean like first year undergrad CS or first year grad CS maybe. Every algorithm is, is no more than five lines or six lines of code. What we do is extraordinarily simple. The, the challenge has been where we put most of our effort in is like catching user error. Yes, these two sketches are comparable and you'll get the right answer <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you do the calculation. So here's a thousand lines of code to make sure that that all works around the five lines of code that, that does the work. And then the other thing that we do, and this is more of the research endeavor is, here are how these concepts help you answer and address bioinformatics and biological questions. And yeah, you can get this answer other ways. Here's a tool that does it. You don't need to use the tool. You can implement it in your own Python in five lines and you'll understand it better and that's great. Um, but what I really wanna do, you know, my focus in all of this is I, I wanna advance biology. I'm not a software engineer or computer scientist by researcher. I am doing software engineering and building computational biology tools to answer bio to help others answer biological questions. And so I don't really care if you use my tool. I use my tool. It's a force multiplier for us. Maybe it'll be a force multiplier for you, but you have to wade through documentation, installation, all that other stuff. We'll lower those barriers as much as possible. I think that's where this perspective that I view as sort of fatalistic comes from. I just don't want whatever supplant sour mash to suck worse than sour mash does. I want it to be better than sour mash. So that's my goal. And, and that has not always been the case in science as a whole, you know, especially with closed source and other things. You're like, man, it worked better five years ago than it does today. Why is that? And so I'm, that's, that's sort of my benchmark is I want to advance biology and bioinformatics. And it doesn't have to be using Python and Rust and Sour Mash. It can be some other way. But if we can train people that this is what they should expect of good software, that it has documentation and tests. And, and a reasonable command line, and it gives them straight answers and decent visualizations, then hopefully the next tool will be better than mine. And it won't be a situation where like, why did this tool beat, beat out Mindshare for, with Sour Mesh? Like, it's not, it's not nearly as good. So sort of a self, it, there's a selfish component to that. And it, Sour Mesh uptake has been rising. But at the end of the day, I don't, I, I try to actually avoid telling people to use Sour Mesh unless they have to. I don't know of any other tool that does this. I usually try and say, here are a bunch of other tools that will do this thing. So that's a partial answer, Matthew. Questions, thoughts? Uh, that, so that, that's actually great. So uh, it, a very comprehensive one. So thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> I have uh, one other question, but I also want to be cognizant of other people in the audience and I don't want to hog the floor. So Cameron, I'll defer to you to uh, do some more moderation. Yeah, Matthew, if you have one final question, we can take that and then wrap up. There's no other questions in the Q&A, so the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, so uh, since I also kind of work at the, the petabyte scale when it comes to data analysis, I was quite interested when you mentioned that uh, you are also uh, in some of these more interesting and gnarly scenarios tackling the petabyte scale. So can you touch a little bit more on that just in terms yeah. of how the actual distribution of the yep. the analysis works and uh, and also yep. just some of the challenges and and also the excitement uh, that comes along with that. Yeah. Gosh. So I'll try and be brief this time. So um, the the part that doesn't scale that needs to look at all the data is the part that doesn't scale well with Sour Mesh. That's the part that goes from the raw data to the sketch. And that we distribute, um, I, Luis is extremely, Luis Erber, Dr. Luis Erber, who, who manages this part of things, is extremely good at stealing compute. And so we have multiple processes running on multiple HPCs. I think for a while, NERSC might have been one of them. Uh, downloading, being notified when new data shows up and downloading it in this sort of distributed denial of service way from the, the, the central archive and then um, sketching it and then communicating these much smaller sketches to our server. So the, the download of the data, we didn't send the code to the data because 
NCBI, which is where we download these things from, doesn't actually permit that. It, it sort of does. We're working on that. But at the time, it didn't have data in the cloud. It had data via accessibly via website. So we would, rather than having a single system pulling down all that data and bottlenecking it, we had many different servers, Amazon and, and, and various HPCs downloading it. And then once you've scrunched the data down to a small amount, you could actually store it on a reasonably small amount of hard drives. So we have, I think we have a 20 terabyte archive on our local HPC that's got all of the sketched data from about um, 20 petabytes of, of, of NCBI data. Um, then uh, you can either run across all that data and, and we do like, um, I, I like to use this, uh, we, we, we do a pretty janky dial of, of petabase scale compute. We literally have a million, we literally have one sketch per file and we have a list, a file, a text file that contains a list of all of these sketches. And that's one of our ways, the paper I was showing earlier on petabase scale search literally just iterates across the list of files in a multi-threaded way. So we're doing a, not a, we're doing a denial of service attack on our file server now. So, you know, that, that are, uh, we try and run only one at a time. Otherwise other people in the lab get angry at us. Um, more recently, for a talk that Luis gave a year ago at JGI, he developed an index using RocksDB that was an inverted index of the sketches, of the hashes that are in the sketches. And that's what permits um, real-time, essentially real-time query of things in certain regimes of data set sizes. So we can query many large data sets with small queries and get real-time answers. It, the query time scales for an inverted index scales with the size of the query. So if you do a large query, it takes correspondingly longer. So the, the sort of general answer to you is we do the dumbest possible thing that will work with the resources we have available to us because we don't have the funding or the perspectives to, um, we don't have the funding or enthusiasm from the funding agencies to do cleverer things. We're mostly engaged in trying to figure out what the right use cases are. And the most excitement we've had is we come up with like use case, like Luis's use case was, I don't want to work on my thesis, so I'm going to write code instead. Then he did that, and immediately we had two collaborators that are like, oh, we can use that for this and for a biogeography study and an infectious outbreak study. And then once those got published and we started making this stuff more accessible, now there are people doing things we never would have thought of using the public website, the, the branchwater.saramash.bio website, and they're just using it to do things, and then we find out days, weeks, months later, hey, we used your website to do this cool thing and here's our publication. We're like, oh my God, people are using our stuff. We had no idea, that's awesome. We should write down that use case because maybe that will convince a funding agency to fund us. So um, I'm just gonna come all the way back around and say, I feel like, and I, I don't know if I'm doing the biology community a disservice here. I'll just say, I, I was trained as a biologist. I identify as a biologist, but the, the handicap we have of not really training people at the undergrad and, and grad level in computational biology means that the space of possible use cases given a new tool is takes a long time to populate. And so I feel like we are, we spend a lot of time giving people one more stepping stone into the unknown. And then from there, maybe they can see something that we can't see about how they might use this. And then we code that back into our software and start writing grants around like, hey, maybe we should enable this for everybody because look at all these use cases. And um, <clears throat> You know, I'll just give one specific example. Lots of people are sequencing wastewater now because of COVID. Our tool is one of the few tools that can handle sort of fairly complicated, it's a very complicated set of DNA in wastewater. Our tool is one of the few tools that can handle it, um, but the computational funding for analyzing wastewater hasn't really caught up with those needs. So we're trying to figure out what do people actually, what answers do people actually want to get out of this data type? And then what funding agency will actually support, you know, it's the eternal, like, how do we convince somebody to give us money to, to develop more deeply in this direction? And I think that we are still at the mercy, This, I guess this, I'm going to keep on banging on this. We're still at the mercy of biologists, professors on review panels who are trained as bench biologists and don't really understand why you would want to do this kind of work. And, um, you yeah, know, but that's, that's, that's the field I chose. So, uh, uh, and it's fun. It's fun to convince people of things, but it's, um, it's what I feel like I spent a lot of my time doing. <laughs>
Thanks. That was a great, uh, great answer. And I also f think uh, summarize kind of uh, some similar problems and feelings that we have in the particle physics community. So I, I might bug you over email later. Yeah, I'm happy to chat. Always happy to chat. Just another place fostering cross-discipline uh, collaboration. I absolutely love it. Let's go ahead and adjourn for today. This has been a fantastic exchange, and I want to extend a huge thank you to Titus from UC Davis, and of course, to our entire audience for joining us this month. If you're not already signed up for our newsletter, make sure you subscribe, and you can find that subscription link on our website, meetup.doepy.org. Or if you don't like receiving just one email per month, you can, of course, keep a regular eye on that website for information about our upcoming exchange next month. And speaking about next month, we're going to be joined by an individual who many of you may already know, Stuart Campbell. So we're very excited to have a prominent leader from BNL join us. So make sure that you tune in next month to listen in and ask questions to our panel with Stuart. Thank you all again for joining, and I'll see you all next time.